Appreciate the accommodation. Now. I didn't want to be pushed out, which was kind of the main solution was like, I can't fit you in, Paul. And so glad we could work it out tonight. And uh, you got permission uh, from my mom that I could skip trivia. So that was that was cool. <laughs> I did. I mean, I feel so touched about it. Um, but I'm just excited to hear your presentation. Uh, and I have nothing to show. I'm just going to I'm just you're just going to talk. Yeah, that's fine. That's cool. That's oh, cool. As long I, as we get Charlotte at some point, then we're all good. I can do uh, that. I got Henry okay, here too good. because Jen good. is at trivia. But yeah, I'm just gonna talk. And, so and lastly, before we get going, we're near 2,500. Let's hope to get over that uh, before the end of this presentation. We have one more after. You will not want to miss that one. It is the there is Charlotte. Beautiful. Uh, is the co-managers draft, um, which is such a fun time. So I definitely tune in for that. But yeah, let's get those numbers above 2,500 if we can, and take it away, Spore. It's all you. All right. Thank you, Nick. So. I, uh, you know, I, I do some podcasting, so I'm pretty adept at making sure that I continue to say the name. So even though I'll have nothing here and you're just going to see my screen, I'll continue to mention the names of the players that I'm talking about. So what I'm looking at here is 10 players who are going outside the top 180p at the NFBC. That's the data that we have right now with top 50 upside. I'm going to hit on some points about why they can get there. Uh, and obviously we're talking about guys who can break out. So we're talking about the high end things going right. All right, so let's start. we got a mix of hitters and pitchers and even a reliever. What? A reliever? Let's start with Fran Mill Reyes. Now, the ADP I'm going to give is since January 1st um, at the NFBC. I think there's 40-something drafts fitting under that. Uh, let's see here. Oh, wow, there's already been 73. Wow, that, that number has skyrocketed. Anyway, Fran Mill Reyes is going 121st overall since January 1st. Now, this guy's a power stud. We all know that. And that's obviously going to be his main path. He hits 35 homers per 600 plate appearances in the majors. He's hit 30 twice, including 30 last year on the button in just 466 plate appearances. He's got prodigious power, guaranteed playing time. He's outfield eligible again, which by the way, that doesn't really matter for our purposes. Um, you know, he can be a top 50 guy as a UT only or as an outfielder, but it makes him more draftable now. And he's even got some average upside. The way Fran Mill Reyes destroys the ball, um, he can hit for a pretty good average. He's a 260 career guy. Don't be surprised if he can spike something even better. And the path to top 50 for him is very Nelson Cruz-esque. A lot of things I've been talking about probably remind you uh, of what Nelson Cruz can do. So the type of season I'm seeing here is 40-plus homers, 100 plus ribbies and something in the 270 average or above for Fran Mill Reyes on his way to the top 50. Let's jump into the closer. It's Giovanni Gallegos. If, you, if you've been following any of my work this offseason, you already know I'm a big, big Giovanni Gallegos fan. Took him very early in the uh, first pitch in Arizona draft. I want to say it was the third round. Hader and Hendricks were gone. So I took the next guy. I want to say maybe Class A was too. I think I took him as the third or fourth closer off the board. He's been nothing short of elite since becoming a Cardinal. So shut up about Luke Voigt, Cardinals fans. You're very whiny and it's annoying. But 32% strikeout rate, 6% walk rate, 274 ERA, and a .85 whip in 171 innings as a Cardinal. He took over the closer's role in late August last year and logged an MLB high 12 saves from August 30th on. Uh, so the concern over the role seems unfounded to me. I know, I know, and even in my closer chart that I put out the other day, I put him under the medium instead of the high. For me, he's high. I'm drafting him as such, but there is this idea out there that is a little bit of a medium, uh, you know, sort of hold on the closer's role with guys like Alex Reyes and Jordan Hicks hanging out there. Forget for a moment that that they couldn't throw a ball to me for crying out loud. They have no idea where the ball is going. We saw Reyes last year as closer. He was good for a while, but eventually they had to move on. Um, and they've been talking about starting one or both of them. So I don't think that they're that they're concerned with getting those guys in there as closer anymore. Seasons of 74 and 80 innings in 2019 and 2021 say that Gallegos can handle the full season. Um, top closers regularly finish in the top 50. And I think Gallegos can, can have a top three closer season, maybe with Hedr uh, Hendricks and Hayter. Maybe Iglesias gets in there. Doesn't really matter who, uh, but he's also age 30. What are they saving him for? Like uh, sometimes there's a path where a guy might not get saves because they want to keep his arbitration price down. Uh, but at age 30, I just don't see that with Gallegos. He's going off the board at pick 116 on average since the first of the, of the year. 
Uh, his path to the top 50 is 35 plus saves, a 30 plus percent strikeout rate, and elite ratios. So I love Giovanni Gallegos. And in a sea of, of just trouble with the closer pool, I see Gallegos as somebody that you can rely on. And you don't have to pay what I did for him in Arizona. I was kind of, you know, putting it out there, making sure I got my guy because I didn't know if he'd get all the way back. But then I learned that the market isn't as hot on him as I am. So now I can uh, dress appropriately. Or, I mean, uh, draft appropriately. I was reading the chat where it said something about my outfit, and so the word dress went in my head. Uh, next up, and I'm going to be taking drinks of water throughout. I apologize for that. I just, I, I got to have my water. Uh, I already drank all my Red Bull for the day for those that are about to ask. Uh, Zach Gallon is my next guy, number three, with an ADP of 127. Listen, it was an injury-riddled season. We know. No, nothing went well. Forearm, elbow, hamstring, three different injuries, and uh, it really cut his season short. But if you followed Zach Gallon. He finished strong with a 319 ERA, 113 whip over the final 48 innings. Uh, he's got a deep arsenal, arsenal, neutral platoon, ground ball tilt, and one of the best home ballparks in the league. I think that's a bit slept on. We know they have a humidor and all that, but I don't know that everyone realizes just how great of a place it is to pitch in Arizona. Sure, he's got to go uh, to Colorado a couple times a year, perhaps, if the schedule uh, breaks against him. he got to face the Dodgers. he got to face the Giants. I get all that. But this is an elite pitcher, folks. Don't let a little bit of a down season make you think that this is like uh, some unraveling or that he was a fluke when he was putting up the quality seasons before that. His path to the top 50 for Zach Gallon, 200 plus strikeouts, a low three ZRA, if not sub three, a low ones whip. I, I, I'm seeing him as, as somewhat uh, Gosmian. You know, you know, Kevin Gosman had that big breakout season. We saw what he was able to do. Obviously, different path. I'm talking statistically. If you want to look at Gosman's 2021 as something that Gallon can do. That's kind of what I'm seeing. Next up, one of uh, what I'm sure will be called two homer picks, but I don't care. Just, be just because my team's becoming amazing again doesn't mean y'all have to get upset about it. Uh, Akil Badu is number four for me at 156. I'm a diehard Tigers fan, uh, as many of you know. And I'm obsessed with Akil Badu, and why wouldn't I be? He's amazing. I mean, if you're not, what are you doing? Go look at what he's up to. If you're not obsessed with Akil Badu, the only thing I can assume is you're just not aware of what's going on. And I don't say that condescendingly or rudely. We have blind spots with players. We all do. I, I got I got tons of them that I learn. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't deep dive that guy. Now I'm in on him. So if you're not in on Akil Badu, chances are you probably just haven't really dug in on him or you're making too much of the, uh, the fact that he can't hit lefties. I'll grant that. But it was some insane in-season development. And he's a power speed stud I who I think can do enough, uh, even just against righties, to have a top 50 season. Now, he had the 814 OPS in April, right, when he was a breakout. Everyone's like, oh, who's this new guy? Oh, Keo Badu, he's so cool. As fraudulent as can be. It was 44% strikeout rate, 3% walk rate. And plate skills are the first thing to look at just any time, you know, strikeouts and walks for pitchers, strikeouts and walks for hitters. First thing you look at, especially in a short sample breakout. So when he was doing that in April, it was like, this rule five guy is hitting above his head. I'm not really that bought in. I wasn't even like trying to pick him up. I was just going to enjoy it for as long as he could do it. Then he turned the corner. From May 1st on, we saw Akil Badu as a different player. He went from a 44% strikeout rate in April to 24% from May 1st on. He damn near quadrupled. Oh, no. Oh, God, Nick's going to send somebody to get me. I said the D word. Oh, God. Okay, I got to hurry because I, I got about five minutes left now before they come and get me for that one. Uh, but he had an 11% walk rate from May 1st on. 756 OPS. I know that's not knocking your socks off, but that's some really good in-season development from a 22-year-old Rule 5 pick. He also had a 14 homer, 26 steal, full season pace from May 1st on. So even with the left-handed issues, uh, the, the left, uh, excuse me, the issues versus lefty pitchers, I still believe Akil Badu can get there. Brandon Lau was a top 50 hitter last year, despite hitting 198 with a 662 OPS against lefties. Now, Akil Badu is not Brandon Lau. They are built differently, but I bring that up to show you that a heavy platoon guy can still be a top 50 dude if he does the right things. Badu's not going to hit 37 homers the way Brandon Lau did or 39, whatever he had. But I think he can have many, many more steals than the 11 or whatever it was that Lau had. I think he had low double digits. Path to top 50 for Akil Badu, 
low 20s homers, mid 30s steals, better than you probably expect runs and ribbies as that team continues to improve, and a decent batting average because I think they're going to protect him a bit against lefties and put in Derek Hill or Victor Reyes so as to not expose Akil Badu too much. So you might lose a little bit of the volume, but it'll make up for it in the batting average. So he's going off at one uh, at 156 right now. I absolutely love him. And somebody in the chat asked who loses job if uh, Riley Green comes up. Well, if he facilitates a call up, then maybe somebody's underperforming at that point and they can figure it out. To, to predict to project that right now, I, I wouldn't really be able to guess. I'd say right now Grossman and Badu have guaranteed spots, and then we got to kind of see what else is going on uh, with everything else in the Detroit outfield. I feel like I'm missing some. Like there's Victor Reyes. There's uh, there's um, Derek Hill, who I mentioned, but he can only really hit lefties. Am I missing anybody that that is definitely going to have a spot? No, it's it's Badu and Grossman at the top of the lineup, and then it's kind of open. If Green dominates, then he can find that spot. But that's not something I'm too worried about as far as it relates to Badu. Next up at number five, my boy Cabrizi, a.k.a. Cabrian Hayes. Cabrian Hayes and Alec Bohm were two massive dif- disappointments in uh, in 2021 after their 2020 uh, spurts. And, you know, they were a couple of many, many, many players that showed just how uh, worthless the 2020 season was in terms of full season analysis and counting it as a season and, and making a lot of it. It, it, it was bad. Right. It, it was awful. There, there was really no value to it overall. There were a few things you could see, developmental changes um, for the positive or the negative. A couple of things here and there, but for the most part, we just applied confirmation bias. If a guy that we liked did well in 20, we loved it. If uh, if a guy we liked didn't do well, didn't matter, didn't count. Uh, if a guy we didn't like did well, well, it was short. Let's see him do it longer. It was all trash. It was all worthless in terms of analysis. So I didn't get too hung up on uh, Bohm or Hayes. I liked both, but I wasn't really putting them on a ton of teams because it was still such a small sample. Interestingly enough, this is about Cabrian Hayes, but I will say he's holding some value at an ADP of 135 while Bohm is cratered. Everyone's just out on Bohm, and they were kind of neck and neck coming into last year, which is interesting to me, but that's a different story about Bohm. This is about Cabrian Hayes. He's a strong hitter with great batting average upside, but what I really think is slept on and what I really think is going to spur his path to the top 50 here is the speed. I think people are are maybe unaware or just kind of glossing over the fact that he's a speedster. Uh, 66 for 84 in the minors, that's a 79% clip, and he's 10 for 11 so far in 491 major league appearances. Now, obviously, they need to turn him loose a bit because, you know, 10 steals, not going to do it. And even if you extrapolate the 10 uh, across 600 plate appearances, that's going to add a couple more. It's not going to do it. But we got to be talking big stolen base totals to get there. Now, the wrist injury could delay the full-on power growth a bit, but I don't think he needs it to get there this year. The path to the top 50 for Cabrian Hayes for me is a big batting average, something 290-plus, 20-plus stolen bases, and somewhere in like the 17 to 21 home run range. Think of like a Tim Anderson type season. Um, I know when we, you know, we get Tim Anderson, we put him at, at shortstop. That kind of fits. I don't know if we think of Cabrian Hayes in a similar vein because he plays third base and and maybe he just doesn't have that sort of profile in your mind. But he can have those similar traits to Tim Anderson, where he carries a high average, enough pop to do damage, and a ton of speed. I love Cabrian Hayes next year. Number six. This one is is pretty much a straight up pedigree bet. Uh, just betting on one of the best teams that their young guy is going to finally get a full role and be a God. That's Gavin Lux, uh, ADP of 218. I'm not giving up on him after 532 create, uh, excuse me, career plate appearances spread out across three seasons. He's just age 24 at this point, And I, I just refuse to quit the pedigree. It's a pedigree bet. Like I said, uh, but he went 16 homer 16 steals per 600 plate appearances in the minors with a 304 batting average. I don't think you can just fake that and then you come up to the majors and, and you're no good. Sure, some guys bust. I, I grant that. But I'm not at, at the point where I'm ready to say he's anywhere near a bust. I think Gavin Lux deserves at least a doubling of his current plate appearances, the 532, at least another 500 plus before I'd be willing to say, hey, we got to lower his ceiling. He's not that good. And even if Max Muncy is fully healthy and ready to go, uh, most of us believe that the NL will get the DH. Um, and th- thus, Lux will be able to find playing time. He can play everywhere, infield, outfield. He can get some of the DH spots. He can get playing time as a super util 
all over the place. And like Badu, he does have the obvious platoon issue, but that doesn't preclude his inclusion here because he could also be protected. We know they like to platoon, so maybe they give him some of that extra time off against lefties. It puts a little bit more burden on his homers and, and stolen bases because you got to have those counting numbers to get there. But the average gets helped by being protected against lefties. So for the path to the top 50 for Lux is similar to what I see uh, for Hayes and Badu. It's kind of a, in between the two there with the big batting average near 2020 season. However, unlike Hayes, Lux is going to have the runs and ribbies cushions in LA that Hayes will not have in Pittsburgh. So he can hit for a lower average than, than Hayes, maybe even have a couple fewer SBs, a couple fewer homers, but his runs and ribbies could be markedly higher than Hayes. Even though Hayes will be batting at the top of the lineup and Lux might be in the middle, the lineup quality might be enough to kind of bridge that gap for Lux. So either way, I think he can basically be another Hayes type, but uh, Badu type, but I like Gavin Lux quite a bit at 218. I want to say he has dual eligibility as well. In fact, I'm just going to check that. Why not? I'm, I'm doing well on time. Yeah, he has short and uh, second base as well. I really, really like that for Gavin Lux. Number seven. Oops, sorry about that. Number seven is Andrew Benintendi. Now, this one's really just a return, right? He, he's already been there. He's been to the top 50 a couple different times, 2017, 2018. Now, we're a few years removed from that, and I understand that. And uh, it wasn't a great year last year. It was kind of a ho-hum. He had an injury that cut some time, and I do think affected his speed. He's in KC, which isn't a great hitting environment. But this is, this is that type of guy that – I think could bounce back for a big, big season at age 27. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying like, oh, age 27. Those of you who are older in the uh, fantasy community might remember when that was a thing. People would just draft guys strictly based on the fact that they were age 27. That's not what I'm saying here. But he is still only 27. So he's still relatively young. He's shown power and speed throughout his career with good batting average. Doesn't strike out too much. The stolen bases were the big missing component in 2021. He went eight for 17. That's horrendous. Quick maths for y'all. That means he was caught more than he was successful. Now, I think the rib issue that kept him out for a bit in mid-June might have played a role there. Now, he was only 7 for 13 before that. And, and so I'm not saying that it was the only issue, but he was only 1 for 4 after returning. So he basically stopped running. So he might have still had a terrible rate, but he might have had a higher volume had Benintendi felt healthy enough to continue running once he returned. Bottom line is, with health, I think you can get back to top 50 pretty easily. 280, 2020, uh, you know, KC kind of has to move up a little bit. They're, I think there's an expectation that they start to make some moves forward as well. Maybe they're this year's Tigers where, uh, you know, they have one bad month, but then the rest of the, month, rest of the, rest of the year they're kind of competitive. I could see something like that. But it's not going to take a ton for Andrew Benintendi to pop his way back into the top 50. So he's kind of a ho-hum boring guy at, at pick 191 that I'm willing to bet on because there's still upside here. And I think sometimes we limit upside to guys who are like 24 and under and have barely played in the majors. Veteran players have upside. We see it all the time with guys popping up. You know, they have up, ups and downs within their profiles. Andrew Benintendi can definitely spike back up, have another great season and be a top 50 player. Number eight, our second Tiger. Tariq Skubal. Um, he showed a lot in his debut. First off, he's going off around pick 185. Very interesting lefty. Remember, when things were, were kind of coming together for the Tigers, it was Casey Mize way up here as a 1-1, obviously. Matt Manning had really stepped up. And then who's this pop-up guy, Tariq Skubal? Well, now flash forward a year, year and a half, and he's the best of the bunch for many, at least in a fantasy realm for sure because of his strikeout capability. Mize, to me, I continue to say uh, it, his peak is kind of peak Jordan Zimmerman, statistically speaking. I stand by that. I still think that's what it's going to be, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not as that's not as impactful fantasy-wise because it doesn't have the strikeout total. And then Matt Manning's a big wild card right now. But is the guy who I think could be the big breakthrough in 2022. Um, he obviously showed a lot in his debut with 26% strikeout rate, 7% walk rate. That's a great foundation. But, oh, no, he just allowed three more homers right now while I'm talking, which is crazy because it's January 26th. I don't even know who he's pitching to, but he is giving up homers. I can see it. He's actually playing in my front yard. So I don't know what's going on with Scooble. He's training in my front yard because of the lockout, but he is giving up dingers to the neighborhood kids, which is a little alarming. That said, I see the premium swing and miss, 
and I see fixable issues with an arsenal deep enough of developing to figure out righties and figure out the home runs. They're kind of one in the same, let's be honest. A big platoon issue like that uh, is part of why he allowed so many homers. I, I think righties hit a ton of the homers. Let me get you an actual figure on that. They hit 34 of the 35. He gave up 35 homers last year. How do you do that? I think the fact that he even had a 434 ERA with 35 homers tells you how amazing he was. Like that, that is truly a feat there for Tariq Skubal. So he needs to fix it, obviously, right? Home run issues can be scary. They're the kind of the quickest way to ruin an ERA, but you're not destined to be a home run guy for your entire career. Some guys will be, others learn to fix it. I think Tariq Skubal is somebody who can fix it. His path to the top 50 is a mid threes ERA, a one teens type of whip, and then 200 plus Ks, a bunch of Ks, bunch of wins, hopefully. Uh, on that Tigers team, I would I would project him more for like 13 wins. I'm not I'm not really thinking that the Tigers are going to blow up this year necessarily, but I think he can get another good win, a, a, a good win total, not another one. He had eight last year. I think he can add four or five wins to his total, get a ton of Ks with good ratios, and I don't see any reason that he can't push 200 innings. He threw 150 last year. They don't have to baby him. I thought they I thought their innings management. For Scooble and Mize last year was really sharp. They they stuck to it. They had those times where they were only going to go three innings at a pop. Um, and I thought that they set both of those guys up to push 180 plus this year. So if Tariq Scooble at pick 185 can get at least 180 innings, I think he can make it in the top 50 this year with some development on that home run issue specifically. Number nine. I'm going way too fast. There's supposed to be 30 more minutes after this. That's unbelievable. Should I just talk really slowly or should I just go back up 10 to one after I, after I finish these last, no, I'm just kidding. Maybe Nick can come on and ask me questions if he wants. Uh, Bailey Ober is, is kind of similar. And I see in the chat asking about Ober, like there are, you know, he's another guy with the big home run issue that like, he didn't give up homers in the minors. In fact, on the last pod, uh, Justin and I were talking about Bailey over and I said, I'm going to do some homework on him. I haven't done that homework yet, but I'm going to have that uh, study in the homers and kind of seeing what's up there. But yeah, both those guys are really interesting. I like Scooble a little bit more, but I think Ober's uh, particularly intriguing. I want to say he was 36th, uh, the 36th starter on the bat X projections, which is really, really interesting. But yeah, we'll do Q and a after these last two. Number nine, I swear Nick didn't make me do this. I like this guy too, but it is because of Nick that I first got on board with Patrick Sandoval. Pick 209, absolute stud. I mean, you've already heard some stuff about him today. I wasn't going to not include him simply because you guys have heard him, though. Um, I still want to make sure that it's clear that I'm on board with this because I love Patrick Sandoval and what he's been able to do. And we saw a lot of this coming together last year, so it's not even really that crazy to predict a big breakout for him. But at pick 209 for Patrick Sandoval, I'm like, this is so easy to buy back in. Elite swing and miss. It really, really started to come together last year. And frankly, I'm just buying on the continued excellence and further development here. I think that 10% walk rate from last year can be shaved down a little bit. He's had a little bit of a home run issue too, but even the 1.1 uh, from last year for Patrick Sandoval, that's manageable. As long as we can live there or lower, it's all good. He was at uh, 2.5 in the shortened season and 1.4 in 2019, but those were very small samples for Patrick Sandoval. He's just 25 years old. Like I mentioned with Bailey Ober, Patrick Sandoval did not give up homers in the minors, so I don't know that he necessarily um, is, is set in stone as this home run dude. He's also a ground ball type guy, so there's something there where if he can fix what the home run issues are, uh, he could really, really take off. So this is what this was an easy one. Patrick Sandoval, the path to the top 50 for him is a low three ZRA, a low 1.1 something whip, you know, some maybe even uh sub 1.1. I, I could I could definitely see that, and of course, 200 plus strikeouts. Uh, he might even get like 33 whiffs in a game. I heard one time that he got 32. I heard that somewhere. I don't know where, but yeah, I heard that that he got 32 whiffs in a game one time, and I think he can continue to be that great. He has a 14% career swinging strike rate. I mean, that just says 30% strikeout rate is possible. Like it really is. the 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 cheap uh, the the cheap strikeout estimation with swinging strike rate is somewhere between two point two to two and a half x your swinging strike rate. 
if you're at 14, percent I mean, the, 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 that's sky high potential for Patrick Sandoval, and I really love him. So, Angels fans, I know you're looking for pitching. Uh, I, I consider myself like a de facto Angels fan, or a, a, a like a, a side Angels fan, just because I want Trout and Otani in the playoffs. And uh, I think Sandoval could be that ace that really takes you there. You know, Otani could pitch well, and and I know there's expectations of Thor, but Sandoval could be that number one that really sets it up. All right, my last guy, my number 10, if you didn't think it was going to be this guy, then why the hell did you think I was going to wear the shirt? I can say hell, right, Nick? There's no hell. There's no way in hell I can't say hell, right? Anyway, it is Ger Gerard Kalinick. It's Jared Kalinick. Uh, don't just discard him based on a bad rookie year. And in fairness to the market, they're not. I almost wish they were because how often does it happen that a hot prospect rookie comes up falls on his face and the market just discards him. And he's you know, Alec Bohm. What I was saying about Alec Bohm earlier, he just gets pushed all the way down. It doesn't happen as much with power speed guys though. Uh, we give a lot more uh, leeway for them, understandably. So I'm not even, I'm not even that surprised by it with, with Kelnick specifically, but he is at uh, pick 125 on average. I mean, the thing of it is, it's like, the way the fantasy market behaves with guys like this, it's like before they ever hit the mo the majors and they, they never done anything, they're a hot prospect. They could go 90, 90. Like, I, I don't know, dude. I feel like if, if things just really go well, he could hit 90 homers and 90 steals, dude. I don't know. I know he's 21 and he's never been in the majors, but I just feel like he could. And then he comes up and uh, he's a clown because he had, he, he flopped in 377 plate appearances at age 21. I just don't get that. And again, with Kelnick specifically, the market has not severely overreacted to his failures, but even 125, I think, does have plenty of upside to it with that pick. I mean, he hit 294 with a 26 homer, 28 steal per 600 plate appearance rate in the minors. Now he had 894 plate appearance. He was a real quick to the majors type of guy with just 894 minor league plate appearances, including just 30 games in AAA. So basically he was learning on the job. And if you were following the Mariners last year, you saw that learning as things were going on, just in the course of different plate appearances. The batting average was still sub 200 by the end of the year. I don't have smoking gun stats to point to with Kelnick, but if you were watching him, you know, not necessarily every night, but I watched a lot of Mariners games down the stretch because they were a really exciting team. You could see the development was happening. He was really starting to figure things out, chasing fewer awful pitches. He'd still have issues where he'd strike out on something, you know, that was 57 feet in, in the dirt. But I really was impressed by the by the growth of Kelnick on the job last year. And uh, I almost wish the market was leaving him in the in the dust a little bit more. But like I said, I'll I'll take that pick 125 right now. The path to top 50 is uh, across the board counting category goodness to cover the batting average because I still think there could be some batting average flaws here. Um, think of like Story, Trevor Story's 2021 as a foundation for Kelnick. Story hit 24 homers with 20 steals, 75 ribbies, 88 runs, and a 251 average. Add a few more stolen bases and a few more ribbies. And I think, I think we can get there. Story was 60th last year, by the way. So just repeating stories 2021 wouldn't exactly get Kelnick into the top 50, but it'd be darn close. So I'd be happy with that. But I think he can add a few more steals, a little bit more runs and ribbies because he's on a better team, than although Colorado's offense makes up for the fact that they're a bad team. So maybe I shouldn't say it like that. But I do think he can steal more than the 20 that Story had. So if you put him as like a uh, you know low 20s homers, high 20s steals, 80-80, with a 250 average, I think that gets it there for Kelnick. So he's number 10 at pick 125. So just to review, 10 players going outside the top 100 with top 50 upside. These are not ranked. Uh, Fran Mil Reyes was number one at pick 121. Giovanni Gallegos was uh, number two at 116. Zach Gallon was number three at pick 127. Akil Badu was number four at pick 156. Cabrian Hayes was number five at 135. Gavin Lux was number six at 218. Andrew Benintendi was number seven at 191. Tariq Skubal was number eight at 185. Patrick Sandoval was number nine at 209. And Jared Kelnick was number 10 at 125. So there you go. 10 guys who could have top 100 upside or top 50 upside going outside the top 100. And then I can take questions from y'all because I got 25 minutes left still. Kelnick over Adele. What up? I mean, Adele has some, you know, they they have vibes of each other. So 
Uh, I don't know, you know, not necessarily one over the other. Nick, I'll put my headphones in in just one second. I see you there out of the corner of my eye. Give me one sec. Um, but yeah, sure. I mean, if you like, if you like uh, Adele more, and I know you're an Angels fan, sure. I prefer Kelnick. He is, I mean, they're about the same age too. He's a year younger. So it's like either or. Yes, Nick? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I figured I'd feed you the questions. Uh, oh yeah, that's fine. Let's do that. Come on. Let's go. So Shane Boz versus Aaron Ashby versus Tanner Houck. What is your appraisal? <sighs> My appraisal is I like all three, but boy, I wish I had some more answers, which we're going to get some clarity on that coming into, you know, coming into the big draft part uh, of the season in, in mm. March. I think what it's going to be is Boz is not going to start with the club there. I do have him the highest ranked of the group because he's, I think he's kind of shown the most already. I don't know how Boston gets through without having Hauk in the rotation. Right. Like they, they don't yeah. have enough good guys. Um, and Ashby, I love him, and I ranked all six of their guys, so including Hauser, in my top 100 because I, I, I really like all of their guys. I like Lauer too, but I do, I, I do see him kind of starting on the outside, looking in with Hauser getting that role as you mentioned earlier today. So that's the order I rank them: is Boz, Hauk, Ashby. Actually, I think I have Ashby uh, and Hauk like literally right next to each other. So if Hauk does have a starting role, though, he will move up. And in fact, he will move up over Boz, to be honest. So, so, that, so stay tuned on that. So this is going to sound really stupid because, again, hey, 12 team where I can do stupid things and say stupid things. Now, I is with Shane Boz, Aaron Ashby and Tanner Hauk. Um, obviously, Boz is going to cost the most. He's going yeah. highest right now. But then again, of course, NFBC stuff is a lot of draft champions. I think swayed a lot of that ADP at first. True, because it, it makes sense to take any three of those guys in draft champions. A lot right, more sense. Eventually, so we're, I mean, we're saying like, hey, like May 1st or so, this might be rather even or even pushed away from Tanner because he's getting the, the bump in some way because he has more playing time, we imagine, in April. Mm -hmm. uh, so what could you do in a 12-teamer? Well, you could draft your – your lineup that is all your hitters without necessitating a, a bench spot for it and then you theoretically could draft all three of those and fill out the first couple of weeks with just toby types if you True. want to you and actually just could. get by in april with volume stuff that like that's what your bench is your bench is actually just shane Boz and, and aaron ashby just chilling and waiting it might be really hard to do because maybe Aaron Ashby doesn't actually get those opportunities because Adrian Hauser does really well in April and who cares? And Eric Lauer has that third spot or fourth spot rather. But yeah, Tanner but Houck, you know, guys I mean, don't get through with just one. five, right? Yeah. So, so Tanner Houck is the, is the safe one there. I'm finding myself liking him more. Yeah. Uh, he's he's just so good. The slider is really the thing. You just got to get that. Um, CSW is high, but the actual strike rate is low. So he needs to be more efficient with that but once he does that i mean he can he can certainly soar absolutely um what i want to mention uh, I, I i i was doing some research on this first of all love the pa the panda i mean it's great it, it just i hope the back is good if the back is, is fine back there yeah I, exactly i should have mentioned the back but obviously oh, I keep an you, eye I on news for that uh, but yeah i mean oh yeah i think i, I, I think did kind of goes well the same too. like everyone kind of knows Sandoval's yeah back stuff so um that's that's great john means as uh as as glenn colton just mentioned on the other mm -hmm. one like uh yes uh not colton that was a uh, um fred did friend friend zinky mentioned um he did i thought it yeah. was colton uh colton did pander to me with sandoval so oh that's uh, right that's right that's right guys. oh yeah oh my heart hey man um, the <laughs> when he said that too i was i was i was typing his <laughs> notes because I, when i texted you i said i got one more notes it was his and then he mentioned sandoval i'm like well there's gonna be more sandoval love coming in about 20 oh, minutes man. um so uh so yeah the panda which i learned today is a panda is a real thing it's apparently bread soup um oh, interesting but uh but anyway i the um the other one i did want to mention outside of john means which i know sounds crazy I mean, I really tried to challenge myself here when you had this. I was like, oh, can I think of someone that's like outside the top 300 or something? And there was one guy, and it says it's it's to the to the words that you said is what made me think of him. You said that a high upside guys do not have to be young. Yes. Can you imagine who I could be thinking of? Carlos Carrasco. No, but that's Dang. a good guess because he had the bone spur removed. Let me let me let me take one um, more guess. Pitcher, the there idea. has to be a pitcher, right? Of course. It, I mean, come on. Renz Kluber. Nope. I don't know if he's going that late. I just tell uh, me. I don't want to. Someone else who's also been there before did it in 2017, 2018, has been uh, um, outside the top 300. Patrick Corbin. 
Corbin. Okay. Uh, you guys, this you is can't quit nuts. Corbin. So I was going, I was even doing more digging on Corbin just now. And I found something that like is really shocking. So you guys know on the player pages right now, um, not forever, but right now, fastballs are kind of conjoined as one. Mm -hmm. So there's sinkers and four seamers for Corbin. Um, but his strike rates across all fastballs in 2018, 2019, when he was good, was below, actually not strike rates, zone rates, was below 50%. But in 2017, when he wasn't there yet last year, obviously not there, it was like 55%. Oh, wow. So it makes me start thinking. I looked more into the sinker. The sinker was like at forty six percent and had like a p val of eight in two thousand eighteen. So I'm I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on. You know, it, <laughs> here's the thing though, too. Like, and and he spiked the big velo boost too. Corbin did right ninety two point five last year. Yeah, well, he had the highest velocity year. since two thousand seventeen. Yeah, like, and and that that is something. And he is thirty two, so it's not even like crazy. You know. Sometimes we have to get ourselves in the mindset of understanding how a guy can turn around. And when they're at their lowest, it is hard, right? A lot of times people want a comfortable buy low. Like if I have to hear that Aaron Nola is a buy low one more time, someone's getting a throat punch. No, he's not. Everybody knows he's no great. Violence. Uh, listen, it is necessary. It's not violence. It is just a reminder to stop saying that in a remarkably violent manner. Uh, but no, like, Look where Robbie Ray came from. If I told you before the season last year that Robbie Ray was going to win Cy Young, you would have laughed hysterically, right. right? And I'm not saying that Corbin will. In fact, he wasn't even my pick. He was yours. I'll let you continue on him. But, like, we got to get our minds in places where you have to see where they could turn around. And this is why the whole track record matters with guys. We get so focused on the year, maybe two years before, that we, we blank out the fact that once you have a skill, you own it. You know, big Rob, Rob, Ron Chandler saying – and Corbin's been elite before. So as much as I want to laugh at you for that one, when you said it, I was like, I want to be smart and not just dismiss these. These ones that everyone like universally dismisses are the ones I st I've been investigating more and more these last couple seasons. Mm. It, when I'm in, when I'm part of the laughing too, when I'm like, nah, 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 that guy's, I'm out. I don't even care. I need to look further. So what else yeah. are you seeing? What are you seeing with Corbin that could really spur a return? Well, it makes me wonder if um... – so first of all, the, the highest velocity was 2017. He wasn't there. And then he had to actually brought it down. It was lower in 2018 and 19. That's the crazy part. The slider stuff is pretty much the same. It's still making, you know, it's missing so yep. many bats and all. That's the thing. It makes yeah. me wonder if it's just sinker command. Is it, because um, that was really the thing. It was the sinker that did, it was so effective. Obviously limiting home runs and stuff is an important factor too. Uh, but I don't know. It just makes me wonder a lot. And now I'm all of a sudden just, uh, after watching Alex Chamberlain's VAA um, presentation about just, hey, this is why Herman Marquez's fastball is not good despite being 95. I, uh, yeah, it makes you think a lot more about this stuff. So you it's just, it's just at all? out there just about there like any... hey, Corbin, if he fixes that, which he theoretically could. Yeah, I, I agree. Sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to steamroll no. at the end of the year there. Are, are you taking Strasburg at all? He's yeah. also like free. Yes, because I mean, if he's throwing, if he if the velocity's back up in any way, which we have no idea if it will. I mean, I'm not saying it will. I don't expect it, but especially last round where he's going. Yeah, like you'll know right away. You'll exactly. Know instantly. And we know and that with all the injury guys, right? Like uh, yeah. on the higher end, Verlander, right? I, I guarantee the second he's he's throwing 98, and if sitting, like you said, not just touching, but if he's sitting high 90s in spring, his ADP goes up 50. Right. Let's play the scenario. Strasburg comes out, Jupiter, and uh, has his first start, makes his three innings, sitting uh, 94. Is that enough for you? Oh, oh, be still, my beating heart. What, what, where, where's well, his I ADP think, I think, going I think at that point? Strasburg was at like 93 and five or something when he was okay. last good. So if he's doing 94. Okay, maybe maybe like, not that high then. Well, let's let's say a firm 93 though with spikes of 95, yeah, 96. I would still be intrigued and I would still take a chance because yeah, ramping up and everything. Yeah. I don't know from the first start. Where do you think his ADP will go? He's at 324 right now. Yeah. Uh Strasburg is. Where do you think his ADP will go if he has three strong showings in spring training that look Man, Strasburgian? I have, I have no idea, but I'm certainly gonna promote it then <laughs> yeah because I mean, here's the thing this, this yeah. is why drafting him now makes some sense if you have any interest in this right don't right. just draft him if, just because i'm saying if you don't like strasburg but the thing of it is it would go up i think 120 150 yeah, picks. He, would, he would shoot up 
Yeah, Absolutely. he'd go crazy. Yeah. And he's 324 right now. So if you have any inkling in Strauss, get in a winter what? draft now and get that cheap share. What are we doing here? Uh, Michael Kopech, if you want to talk about anybody that like yes. in an instant. I mean, I said it this morning. I I mean this. If Michael Kopech has the five spot, if coming out of the camp, the confirmation, he is our fifth starter. I'm drafting him before Dylan Cease. I have no problem with that. I don't. Um, I don't. I, I, I think if you look at these two guys, Kopech is the better, more consistent one. I love Kopech. Uh, who 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 did you compare Kopech to earlier? Yancey said something about uh, him in Shane chat Buzz. earlier. Oh it's, yeah yeah yeah. And I wasn't yeah. sure if he was. You know, he's always tongue in cheek. So I, I didn't know he was being serious and he was like trying to debate it or whatever. Cause I love both of them. And I think that's a very apt comp. So apt that I have Boz 48, Kopech 49. So I'm like nah. right there with you that they're right there. And if Kopech gets that that starter job, like you're saying, he leapfrogs uh, over right, Boz right, right. for sure. He goes it's, up 10 it's spots for crazy. minimum. I'm, I'm really curious what that 80 people will be. Um, I mean, think about like, it'll go know, bananas. Chris Paddock got the job or something, yep. right? That's a great uh, call and, out. Yeah, I remember in our PL Legacy League, he was drafted in like the 13th round. We're like, whoa, this is getting crazy. And that was ultimately justified, right? If, if Kopech um, gets a starting job, his ADP goes up 100 picks. Guaranteed. Yeah. He's 176 right now. He will be in the top 100 if and, he gets, and if he gets like, a job. Logically, for me right now, I don't see a scenario where it doesn't happen just because, uh, I mean, maybe they bring back Rodon. That's really the only thing I could think of where then, and then Keiko has to, you know, it's going to take the five spot. They're not going to push him out. Yeah. Um, or there's, you know, that, that, that's really the only way I see is that they get, because there's no one really else left to push him out. No. And, it, and that's not to mention, like, it's not like Kopech and Boz are the same in the sense of, that uh, Kopech has thrown a lot more, even though it is in relief. That's still a lot more volume that there, it's not like he'll just get 140 or something. Exactly. So they'll let him do a thing for like 160. I would He's imagine. 26. I think he would go 160. Yeah. I think he would get a chance to have a pretty full season. And even at 150 innings, Kopech can put up a gigantic season. So I, oh, I'm, certain, I'm really yeah. keen on him too. I'm with you. Speaking of Rodon, um, yeah. what is your outlook on him next year? Cause I was stunned. I had not noticed this the other day when I was looking at the bad X projections. Do you want to know where they have him? I, I'm, I'm imagining super high second among Second. pictures get out of here that's so cool yeah and like i was like holy smokes i was looking at he, it i mean he's that good that's i know the thing, De, DeGrom number it's just one about the injury and then rodon and cole were tied that's so crazy and and I the mean, projection it's, it's not so nuts it's just 308 era nuts. well the slider but, is not as good as we think it is um, it, it, it fully buys uh 2021 and sprinkles some health on top so it's 151 right. innings with a 33 percent strikeout rate 308 era 108 whip is that that out of pocket for rodon it's not I mean, that it, crazy it, it, but it, for me it's not a projection because i thought projection was supposed to be more like 50th percentile i think it's more the top end but i i like that it i like that it put the big dog projection i'll, I'll say this if you're telling me that rodon is averaging at least 94.5 in his fastball next year and does not get shut down. You know, doesn't have an For any in injury issues. Yeah, he's top ten to me. I'm I'm you fine know? with that. Like I I that, have him. That, that's parked. the thing. It's just such a. I have a. I I've written the top fifty. I think in my uh, in my rankings right now. I'm like thirteen thousand words in. <laughs> I love it. And uh, which is just so dumb. I. Uh, but... No, it's not. No, my SP guys were like that. I did over a hundred thousand oh words one God. year. It was uh, amazing. But uh, with Rodin, I actually I made a whole tier of a lot of these guys around like. 30 or so which is just all these guys are studs but you're just betting on injury or not it's that glob and right where all the talent for me the talent is similar to a group that can range like 30 players long but right. who gets hurt who gets a few extra wins who gets shut down due to innings it's those tough little factors but the talent isn't that disparate between say like pitcher 30 and pitcher right. 70. you know one one player in that tier that i really hate i i i didn't mention during the, the thousandth episode again congratulations thank you thank you for episodes. being part of it that was amazing um, and i it was that it was pablo lopez and i said okay i'm worried because the shoulder three years yep. of this however i forgot something super important he came back he for finished. one start, and he sat two ticks higher than his season average on his fastball. See, I'm I'm all about finishing the season. Even something like Thor, he didn't <sighs> pitch much, but finishing on the mound is big to me because it well, says the team felt that it was worth sending him back out there to say, like, hey, 
he can still pitch. And super different than Shane Bieber. It was the opposite. Bieber was like yep. two to three ticks lower with worse with terrible command. Pablo Lopez was at the top of his game throwing as hard as ever. And that's kind of crazy. I mean, Pablo Lopez is really upping that velocity to 94, 95 consistently now, like sitting there. Um, instead of like the 93 we saw, I that's that can all of a sudden transform that fastball, make me more believe uh, or have more faith in uh, just being fastball changeup. Um, because the slider, is, well, the cutter and the, and the curveball are fine, but they're not something that's going to elevate him normally to like being a top 10, top 15 potential thing. But with that, like, it's making me go, oh, I, I was so like. I was in this nice place, like you know what? I'm comfortable with my decisions. I know what I'm, I'm going to say. Cutting Pablo Lopez. Pablo Lopez. <laughs> I'm good. And I saw, I was like, oh man, but yes, but now what? You know? Oh. I, I I love him. He he's hard to quit, and he was part of my my season this year, and I you know I had a pretty good season overall, and he was he was part of multiple of those good teams, and so even though he wasn't there for me in the second half of the year, I still love Pablo Lopez. I ended up putting him 36th right now. Um, one spot ahead of a guy. I don't know. If I, heard, I haven't heard you talk about this guy. Deline, Deline Ciaz, Ciaz, <laughs> C-E-A-S-E. I don't know oh, much about him, but if, I haven't heard you say anything about him. Do you, I hate do you have to any be thoughts? like the guy that's the, uh, the hater all of a sudden. I know. And like, I, I, I don't like it, it either. Like uh, it's on a lower level. Cause you're, you're kind of, you're sticking your neck out with Dylan C's. I'm not going too far out on a limb to be the anti Bob anti Bobby Dahlbeck guy, but I guarantee I'm getting tweets every time he hits a homer this year. Cause I've been well, so negative well, on the him. Thing. Like I, I guess the, really the, there's so many points I have about this, about like the fastball command, not being great consistently curveball not being developed. And I don't expect that to change. He's still going to walk. He's still going to be inefficient. He need 167 innings to go to go 32 starts. It's, this, it's like, it's hard to imagine 180. If you took 32 starts to get 167, you like, need to improve. Um, he's the premium cherry bomb. And the problem I have with it is what you're looking for is what a lot of these guys already just did that are yep. going after him. You I know, think that's, Jamie I think that's Clanahan fair. And Alec Manoa, like, let me talk about Manoa, uh, Manoa cause you, you've talked about him and this is one that I have a really difficult time with. It's the split between the heart and the head. I love Alec Manoa. I'm mm -hmm. so happy with what he did last year. But how concerned are you about the short arsenal, the platoon split, and the devastating division that he's in? Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, those are the things that are making I've, me not believe that he's like you know going to be a sub three ERA kind of guy. That's what I'm. I I, I think we dip yeah. this year and then shoot back up next year for, for Manoa. Um, that's that's what I think will probably so happen. So the slider honestly is phenomenal. It's I mean, amazing. Seriously, and it's also it passes the eye test too. It's really mm -hmm. nice when like. We're looking at all these numbers, and sometimes we go and watch the game. I'm like, oh yeah, right. This is like one of the filthiest sliders. You're like, oh yeah, I didn't need stats uh, for that. I I, I can what, tell. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but the thing is, that separates him and Cease is that he's got an amazing fastball too. I think mm -hmm. we're really undervaluing this. You know, and now I'm just like so obsessed with VAA. I want to know everything about. I want to every single. Me pitch. too. I know this, and, and I, I want it from a shirtless. Noah is, is like Alec really Chamberlain. highly ranked too, um, because he had multiple days of. I mean, he had days where. He had, I think, over 15 whiffs just on the four seamer, um, so which is filthy. crazy. That's so you, filthy. You don't see that. You know, imagine if Bailey Ober had an elite slider. Oh like, my god! That's kind of what Manoa has been doing, right? So it, it's that skill set isn't going to change. Um, and yeah, you can be terrified of the AL East. Like I get that. Sure. I, and you can but they've be had good pitchers that, you know, before. Like, so I, I honestly like the worst place to pitch. Even if you get yeah. more wins, it's just. Oh God, terrifying! Well, all the time. It, it, hopefully, they're at least in Toronto though, because it's better than being in the minor league parks. Yes, yeah, true, but that's not saying too much. But to his credit, to bad. to Manoa's credit, he was best at home: two thirty two ERA, point sure. eighty five WHIP, four oh eight one twenty four on the road. And it's not that I hate him, by the way. Just for those that oh, no, I'm that not fight, thinking that you are. Yeah, yeah. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Like I got him thirty five, uh, which is lower than a lot of people. I'm just putting Look in a little to bit fireside. of that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm excited. I'm excited because we can talk about that one. I got somebody above him that you would you would vomit at. Like I I I don't know how I can't oh, get God. you on the Eduardo oh, Rodriguez well, I, train. I, oh, well, okay. You don't think I, the context? Just quickly, yeah, I know yeah, we're running ahead. out of time. You don't think the context move alone? Because that's that's the bulk of my my excitement mm. here. Because you know, I've never been a huge Eduardo. We've had firesides where we were flipped, where you liked Eduardo, and I was like, Nick, yeah, oh, what's up with this dude? I mean, but now you're on that side. Second. 
Go ahead. The the major um, the major scen uh, scenery changes that have had major impacts I can remember. I can only think of two on the top of my head. One is Joe Musgrove leaving Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and then it's Garrett Cole leaving Pittsburgh. So, <laughs> I mean, those, so those, the those are just recency those... bias, but I, I I'm sure I could find. Several I know. I'm, more. I know I'm, I'm asking honestly, like other times where like we've had the narrative of it. Ke Kevin and... Gosman to San Francisco. Was that one though? We were just kind of wondering. Like, do you remember you, when Kevin Gosman went there? It was like, I, I know for me, I was like, I hope they relieve him. They should make him a closer. Like he can't, right. like, well, he's exactly. not a we good starter. We were out him from Atlanta going to there, I think, because he just wasn't doing well. And then he- But his believers were like, San Francisco, it's ready to go. Right, right, right. So I, 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 I feel like San, San Francisco is probably going to create, I mean, even, even Anthony right. Desclafani. But I mean, it, but, yeah, it, it's- there are a couple elements as to why he did it. I mean, I will say this, like normally the reason we got excited about those two guys I mentioned was because Pittsburgh was in, you know, the stone age while these other with two this two seamers. Yeah, do it, right. Exactly. And I wouldn't say that the Red Sox were, you know, that out. And it's like those two guys too were thinking, oh, they oh I just mean the park and the division. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't mean, yeah. I don't mean the coaching staff. I just mean park and division. Understood. No, that's okay. What okay. It's like, I right, just want to be factors clear. that go into it are different. Mm -hmm. And those factors I generally don't buy into as much personally. It could be a flaw in what I do, um, but I don't Why think not? it's that drastic of one to go away from the fact that Eduardo Rodriguez's repertoire is a four-seamer, sinker, change-up, and this cutter-slider thing. The cutter-slider thing is just if he's lucky, gets called strikes, and that's it. It is not good in any other way. Okay. The, um, uh, the change-up is sometimes great and sometimes not there. And those starts, it's literally him just trying to get by with fastballs and hoping and crossing his fingers. To his credit, he had a lot of starts last year. I think his fastball was great, but other things weren't there, and maybe that changes. Mm -hmm. But I would say at the end of the day, I don't see a sub-120 whip coming from Eduardo Rodriguez. All the I time. don't either. I, I don't and think we need that. I, that's a, to me, is then going to make it so like he's going to still be like comfortably above 3-5. Um, in ERA, strikeout rate still sh should be good though. That's yeah. like the thing that's like okay. So I think in I some think, ways it's kind of like a Matthew Boyd almost of like if you're chasing strikeouts. Sure, like, it's not the same way, but you know. Yeah, I mean. yeah. No, I hear. I, I do statistical comps sometimes too. It, it's not. It doesn't always have to be that they that they look yeah, the yeah, same yeah. or they have the same. I, right, I like to right. do like statistical profile comps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm not even projecting anything crazy. I, I'm with you on. I don't see a sub one two. I'd say something in the one twos. Um, like a 360 to 380 ERA and 180 plus innings with a ton of strikeouts. Right. I think that's going to generate a really nice season, though. Like and, that's... and is that is the same thing you see for Alec Manoa? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's that's where he's going to regress to, which that's great. That, that's still a good place to regress right, to. Right, 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 right. I I'd say the um the reason that I'm giving Alec his whip Manoa will be uh, Manoa's will be better. Manoa's whip that, will be yeah, better. Yeah. Well, he has a ceiling higher. And like he's I would agree with that over time. So I, I will I will take that side. I, I, I would I would agree. Exists. I would agree with that. And that's yeah. that's fine. I mean, I'm not trying I'm, to get I'm you to be put wrong about Eduardo and I'll be so yeah, I was gonna say I'm not trying to get you to put <laughs> Manoa behind Eduardo. I think I'm trying to get you to raise Eduardo though. And you've been very negative. On well, I, I don't know where I'm gonna put him yet. Um, okay, I haven't decided. It's it, I guess what I'm saying I have like my four guys. I always say like four guys I can trust through the year. Well, not that's right. Drop. Yeah, your 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 core I four. I don't know if Eduardo is in there yet. That's okay. what I'm getting at. Because if you're saying, if we're saying like, yeah, we expect like a mid one two five ERA or something like, or a WHIP rather. See, I that's think he's. Like it can be close to the one thirty side, and then like, I know, oh God, you know. But I think he's more there. But well, here's another thing too: if he holds the 2021 20, walk rate, which I'm not saying he will, I'm projecting mm -hmm. more of the eight percent. But if yeah. he is down that seven percent, that's only one tick. But it can it could be the difference yeah, between that one twenty four yeah. WHIP and a one thirty one type right. deal. So, um. Yeah, it's it's just I like the division too. The ballparks are better, um, and I think that's what's really going to help. If he holds the skills from twenty twenty one, I think Eduardo could be really good. Yeah, I like Manoa too. Um, I tell you what, because we just did that projection thing where uh, you're like, "What do you think about Manoa?"s I'm moving him ahead. I'm moving Manoa back ahead of Erod. Yes, based yes. on this chat. Oh, I'm so excited for you to yell at me in October. Uh no, no, no. no. <laughs> Listen. I'm doing it of my own volition. This is not something where I will come back and say, you made me do uh, it. No, I still got Eduardo pretty high. Too, Cause like Eduardo, I've been saying like, Oh no, I'm not going to, I don't like all this stuff. I look at the ADP and I go, Oh, but 
but yeah, I want him over this guy and that yeah. guy and that guy. So I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not actually that. Against yeah, because it. push come to shove, you you will take him in certain spots. Well, well, right. But I mean, I just had this assumption that everyone I've heard so much about him that like he would be at a place that's you know like the Dylan Cease inflation or whatever. Exactly. Um, and it's not. So I might be just kind of like consensus with Eduardo at the end of the day. Yeah, he's the 57th um, pitcher off the board. That includes closers, but pick 153. I think that's a fair price for Eduardo. Mm. Manoa's up at pitcher 35, pick 97. Well, well, Spore, you did it. I'm super happy you can make it for this. I'm so happy you had a presentation here at PitchCon again. And guess so, what? You guys are going to see more Spore tomorrow. That's right. Uh, when uh, Jake Steely is going to join us for a final Can't wait. Side. Love Jake that's gonna Steely. be great. Uh, we gotta what? figure out exactly what that's gonna be, but we'll be fine. We got time for that. Yeah, yeah. What will cause an issue for me next year at PitchCon? You realize this is two years running now. <laughs> Last year was when Shar was was a mess. Poor Shar, she had her legs weren't working. We were going through that devastating winter storm. Mm. Um, so you know that one was a little bit more catastrophic. This was just kind of rescheduling due to a, a prior I'm commitment just, type I'm just of deal. Say it's something great in your life is going to happen That's okay gonna you I, I hope it if, it if it's anything i hope it's that otherwise i just yeah. hope i can just adhere to the schedule that you give me but nick yeah, yeah, yeah. appreciate you always accommodating me man i i, I love this you, day one's in damn near in the books i know one more thing i can't wait for this i was this part of this draft i cannot wait for this um because 